I am Jeff Delaney. I'm the Vice President for IT and Chief Information Officer, and I'd like to welcome you to the 11th Annual Cybersecurity Awareness Day. This is the longest running Awareness Day campaign or event in USG. We even beat out Georgia Tech. So, yeah, thank you. So we ha actually have a really um, exciting day lined up for you today. Um, and we have some very dynamic speakers and some great events. And but before we jump into that, I want to um, tell you something that I found very ironic this morning. So this is um, October 1st. It's the, the first day of National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We're having our KSU Cybersecurity Awareness Day today. And when I came in this morning, the first thing in my email was a message about a data breach concerning my information. So I get this letter, this email that says, Dear Valued Customer. Aren't, yeah, aren't you, you know, <laughs> glad that they all start out that way? We are writing to notify you of a data security incident involving your personal information. This email explains what happened and will provide information about what you can do in response. We take this matter very seriously and sincerely regret any concerns it may cause you. So basically, their um, customer database was breached. They got my name, address, phone number, email address, password, all of that information from that site. I just found that very ironic, but this is becoming all too common, right? This happens all the time now. And so what can you do to help prevent that or to combat that? Um, that's what today is all about. So we have, like I said, we have some, um, some great speakers and, and we have some um, events over here in the Tech Village is what we're calling it. I don't know why, because it's not Georgia Tech. We need to think of a better name, but it's a tech, the Tech Village. Um, so to begin with, we're going to hear from um, Graham Payne, who was the Senior Vice President and CIO of Global Corporate Platforms uh, for Equifax. Um, this is back during the time when they had their major data breach. Um, I don't know if he can talk about that or if he's allowed to talk about that or if he will, but um, it, it should be a very interesting and, and dynamic um, presentation. Then we'll talk, then we'll listen to uh, Andy Green, who is one of our own KSU um, lecturers about um, automated license plates and the security and privacy around that. And then we have uh, Tyson Fowler, who is a special agent for the FBI, who will be here to discuss cyber threats, trends, and ransomware. Then we'll take a quick lunch break and come back. And um, Dr. Michael Whitman from KSU will also um, talk about cybersecurity education at KSU. And then we'll, have, we'll hear from our um, cybersecurity team and they'll talk about some different tips and tricks. And then after that, we'll have Dr. Lee, who is also from KSU, and he'll talk about social media um, security and data analytics. And then finally, we'll wrap up with Dr. Todd Watson from the USG, who's a close personal friend of mine, having worked with him several years at the Board of Regents. Um, his, his lectures are always um, dynamic and informative and exciting, so um, hopefully this one will be the same. And then um, after we have that, we, we'll have the uh, Tech Village presentations, but next door in this room over here, we have um, a couple things going on. We have a, um, a lock picking event where we're gonna show you how to pick locks. And no, we're not teaching you how to be criminals. Uh, we wanna show you, um, basically you get what you pay for, right? So if you have a really cheap lock, it can be easily defeated. And we wanna show you how easy that is so that you can be a more informed consumer when you're purchasing um, security measures. So there's different levels of locks and we wanna show you those different levels. Um, you don't want to put one of the El Cheapo locks on your front door, but by the same token, you don't want to spend a thousand dollars on a lock to protect a hundred dollar asset. So we want to show you um, the different types of locks um, and, and the ways to defeat them so you can be a more informed consumer. And also, we got some um, Raspberry Pis over there so we can show you how those little computers will, um, or how we're using them in our cybersecurity uh, field. And we have a pen testing village, so you can look at the, um, how we do penetration testing and, and we'll show you, go through some of the demos and some of that kind of stuff. So that's gonna be the fun room over there. Um, not that this won't be in fun and informative, but 
we're going to call that the escape room because we're going to lock you in there and you're going to have to figure out how to pick the lock to get out. Just kidding. Hope there's no lawyers in here. So anyway, that's going to be the, um, the day and it's going to be very fun and dynamic and um, it's, it's a testament to the great job that, um, that our cybersecurity team does. Um, and, and they're very dedicated and hardworking, and the leader of that team is going to be coming up next, and he is um, Stephen Gay, who's our Chief Information Security Officer. So, Stephen. Thanks. Um, all right. So uh, thank you, Dr. Delaney. Uh, so I'm going to make this very, very short, very, very brief. Uh, my name is Stephen Gay. I'm the CISO here at Kennesaw State University. Um, welcome. Welcome, everyone, to KSU's 11th Annual Cybersecurity Awareness Day. Um, I actually remember the very first one we had. Um, I remember some of the others. Uh, we've learned something from every single one of these events, uh, and we expect to actually learn something from this event. Um, so this is actually the kickoff to uh, – can you advance the slide, Edward? Thank you. This is actually the kickoff for National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Um, and the, the, uh, the topic this year, the focus this year, is ultimately something that Dr. Delaney was talking about, which is, you know, own your data, secure your data, protect your data. And one of the things that we're really seeing in the industry as a whole is more visibility into what actually people are doing with your data. Um, we see that with actually the general data protection regulations coming out of the EU. We see it with the California regulations where we ultimately, at the university or whatever organization, we're ultimately just stewards of your data. And you're going to, you know, if you don't already, you actually have a legal right to that data and to understand how that data is going to be used. So we're really going to be kind of focusing on that topic. And we at Kennesaw are actually doing a lot of work on data governance, um, identifying, you know, data users, trustees, stewards, um, and actually ultimately, you know, educating individuals like how we appropriately use your data, how we secure that data. So really, really excited about that topic this year. You're going to hear more about that in the coming weeks. Um, yeah, so let's talk a little more about the month. So, yeah. um, so Cybersecurity Awareness Month at Kennesaw State University, and these are just some highlights. Um, starts today, October 1st, with Cybersecurity Awareness Day um, at the Kennesaw campus. Um, and then tomorrow we actually launch the Digital Smart Cookie Award. Well, what's a Smart Cookie Award? Well, you know, it kind of started out actually as a joke um, because ultimately we can't, no matter how many firewalls we buy, no matter how many web application firewalls we buy, no matter how many endpoint products we buy, the greatest protection that we have is actually our end users and the customers on this campus. Um, whether you're a student and you're aware of how your data is actually being used, um, whether you're a faculty member, whether you're a staff member, whether you're a third party, you know, if you see something suspicious, if you see something where it's like, you know, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be sending my social security number and my tax return over email, we need you to say something. Um, that's going to get you a smart cookie award. It's those individuals that ultimately engage the Office of Cybersecurity, either directly through the service desk, through social media, whatever the case may be, letting us know that there's something out there that, you know, maybe something we need to look at, whether it's phishing, whether it's inappropriate handling of data, something we can just approve on. It's going to get you a smart cookie award. It's going to be a digital badge you can actually add to your email. Um, and it really kind of culminates at the end of the month, and I'm going to kind of jump down here. Um, on October 31st, um, we're actually going to be awarding the department with the most smart cookie awards, an actual great American cookie. Um, and it's on Halloween, so we'll probably decorate it in some really cool, fun way. Um, but ultimately, we're going to be actually be delivering that to the department. So we're really, really excited about, again, trying to get the community engaged, trying to get people more engaged. Um, October 7th, we're actually launching the UITS Cybersecurity Digital Badges. These will be the first digital badges actually from UITS. Um, it's going to be a learning experience for us. I'm as sure as I'm standing here. We won't get it completely right the first time. Um, so again, we're looking for feedback here. They will expire after a year, but we're going to begin awarding those. Be on the lookout for more data and more information in KSU today regarding how you can actually get that and earn that. Uh, Wednesday, October 23rd, you know, we're actually really excited about this. We're partnering with Palo Alto Networks, and we're going to be doing a cybersecurity afternoon at the Marietta campus. Um, it's going to include the Tech Village over here, as well as a couple of speaking sessions, uh, one from a Palo Alto en engineer, and then one from another person. Um, and then so much more, and y'all saw the slideshow, the Pet Meme Contest, um, the KSU Today weekly newsletters, we're actually going to be launching every week, um, a different cybersecurity topic. 
Um, and then soon to be announced cybersecurity mini sessions. One of the things that we've found is unlike kind of this forum where we're in a larger group, um, coming and actually talking to individuals, talking to departments, talking to student organizations is what resonates the most in regards to changing cybersecurity culture. So with that in mind, what I'm charging my team with is doing more mini sessions where we're face to face actually with the campus in smaller intimate group settings. Because quite frankly, and I'm as guilty as this as anyone, a lot of people aren't comfortable asking questions, you know, being forthright in smaller groups or in larger groups. So we want to kind of dial that down to smaller groups. All right, Edward, can you advance it? Um, and again, a word of thanks. This event wouldn't have been possible without the people on this slide, as well as a whole lot more, which is our Vice President of IT and CIO, Dr. Jeff Delaney. Um, our event presenters, specifically Campus Services. Um, sorry, that misaligned. That was me at 10 o'clock last night. Um, our internal and external partners, specifically Campus Services for the speaker gifts. That wouldn't have been possible with our partners at Campus Services. Our event pres presenters. Um, our UITS technology outreach team, specifically Veronica Trammell, uh, Jamie Fulsing, and Randall Dean. Um, the outreach team, Edward Moses, Lindsay Lieb, and Amanda Charter. Um, but most of all, we welcome and most thank our attendees and participants. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to be here. Um, so a big welcome and a thanks for being here. Um, so without further ado, actually, I am, I am done, I think, standing on the stage for the day till this afternoon. So I'm going to turn it over to Edward Moses. Again, good morning, everyone. My name is Edward Moses. I'm the Associate Executive Director for the Office of Cybersecurity, part of University IT Services. I'm going to introduce our first speaker of the day. It's Mr. Graham Payne. Uh, Mr. Payne is a consultant, speaker, and coach. He works with boards and senior executives to help them understand and manage cybersecurity and IT risks. He has over 30 years of experience in consulting in IT management in the financial services, insurance, healthcare, retail, manufacturing, and utility industries. His speech is entitled today, 10 Lessons I Have Learned About Cybersecurity Over the Last 30 Years. Please help me welcome Graham Payne. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. This off, sort of Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, very good. So, um, as Ed said, I've spent uh, the last 30 years in uh, IT and security. Um, and today I would like to share with you 10 things that uh, I've learned. Uh, there's lots more. I've learned probably hundreds of things, but these are 10 that I selected that I thought you'd might, most be of most, might be of most interest to you. Let's start with a little bit of my background. So, I started my career in the 1980s. Uh, as a financial auditor after attending uh, the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, where I studied uh, accounting and information systems. Now, most of my clients uh, at, in the, at that time were large mainframe. Uh, they were running large mainframes. They were primarily doing uh, accounting type transactions, sending accounts payable, managing inventory, um, that type of thing. And they were... Uh, None of these systems were connected to anything other than a green, a green screen terminal that was used to access the mainframe. The big security issues of the time uh, at that stage were physical access to the data center. How do we protect the computer itself and then what happens in the event of a disaster? In 1981, IBM released the personal computer, which really started a whole um, a revolution in the way that we, uh, we did computing and the sort of the tremendous amount of uh, things that followed from that. Um, at, this, at this time, uh, early, there were early services that allow, uh, allowed us to dial up uh, to the internet 
I fondly remember in my, uh, those times when uh, I heard the sound of a modem uh, dialing up at 1200 board uh, to connect to, the, to bulletin boards, the early internet. In 1988, the Morris worm hit and uh, showed how susceptible this, uh, the new internet was to viruses and worms. And tension started to move in security to protecting the network. So we started to see the advent of firewalls uh, and also antivirus, uh, the early antivirus to protect uh, personal computers. By the late 1990s, uh, there was widespread use of the internet and com uh, companies started to leverage this for business. We started to see new uh, business models emerge like Amazon and eBay and uh, Google. And now security focus started to shift to managing and protecting these multiple points of presence that companies had as they expanded their, con their connectivity. When I came to Atlanta in 1996 to help set up a security practice here for uh, Ernst & Young EY, uh, many of our early projects were showing companies how susceptible their internet uh, at points of presence were to attack. And uh, we had lots of great engagements where we were able to do penetration testing to demonstrate the weaknesses around the, their uh, internet controls. Tremendous amount of capital started flowing into the uh, security industry and we started to see um, a lot of new uh, innovations in security protection and defensive uh, technologies. Uh, we also saw the growth of managed security services for the first time. Around the mid-2000s, uh, we started to see um, uh, the the, uh, a new era of data breaches. Um, it, no, 2005 was the year where we started to actually publicly track or track publicly disclosed data breaches. In that year, there were 136 breaches uh, exposing 55 million records. So, um, after 20 years in the consulting industry, I decided that I'd join the corporate environment and I uh, started in Equifax in 2011 as the Vice President of IT Risk and Compliance, uh, having responsibility for a lot of the security uh, operations within IT. Um, and I, and then later I was promoted to uh, the CIO of Global Cor Corporate Platforms running the Enterprise Systems for Equifax. Now I was actually terminated uh, two years ago tomorrow uh, from Equifax. Um, and was uh, later described in a uh, congressional testimony that was given by the chairman and CEO as the human error. Because uh, the root cause of the Equifax breach was, was put down to two things, uh, human error and a technological error. The human error being uh, that uh, the system, the Apache struts vulnerability wasn't patched on a, on a web server, and the, the technical failure was that the security scanner that was supposed to detect the presence of an Apache struts vulnerability didn't detect it. So um, that was an interesting experience for me. Uh, since that time, uh, uh, since my termination, I've uh, last year spent, uh, I testified to Congress, testified to the New York State Attorney General, uh, to the SEC, and um, uh, I'm still being deposed in some of the class action lawsuits that are going. So it's a, it's a long tail to that. I've actually written a book, uh, The um, New Era of Cybersecurity Breaches, which uh, talks about my experiences at Equifax uh, and, and about the, uh, this new era of cybersecurity breaches. So I've seen a lot, all right? I've seen a lot of things uh, over the last 30 years, so I thought that I would talk about these uh, 10 things that um, would be of interest to you potentially as uh, educators, security professionals, students. So first, there's lots of opportunities out there. Throughout uh, my career, I, I have found it uh, very tough to uh, recruit and retain good security professionals. And, this, and it's getting worse. <laughs> um, according to uh, CyberSeek, there are currently th over 300,000 open positions in cybersecurity in the United States. This chart from the um, ISC Squared 2018 workforce study shows where some of the gaps are um, around the world. And notice the significant gap in the Asia Pacific region. What are some of the biggest jobs in demand? Cybersecurity engineer, cybersecurity architect, so, uh, network engineers and architects, administrators and managers, vulnerability and, and analysts and penetration testers, and consultants. So a huge amount of opportunity there. Now, according to uh, other uh, to recent estimates, uh, there are, there's like 
likely to be a three and a half million person shortage in cybersecurity around globally in 2021. And over 750,000 uh, of that shortage is here, right here in the United States. Another survey says that two thirds of the nearly 20,000 respondents to its survey said that their company lacked uh, cybersecurity pro professionals needed today to man effectively manage their uh, risk posture. So it's impacting organizations. Women make up about 14% of the cybersecurity workforce. So there's a, a big gap there as well with, um, and with the huge amount of uh, gaps in security and generally in open positions, it's an area we need to focus on. And interesting enough, about three in 10 cybersecurity professionals came, come to, came to the field from a background uh, outside of information technology. So having an information technology background doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily a prerequisite to becoming a cybersecurity professional. So why is there a shortage? I think there are uh, several reasons, but one survey noted there were a uh, lack of education, a lack, lack of uh, organizations investing in the education of, uh, pro of students around cybersecurity. We still have a lack of uh, programs running at, at colleges and universities. We have a lack of focus of this in high schools. And there is also a perceived gap out there between formal education and the practical hands-on experience that you need to actually be a cybersecurity professional. I think one way of addressing that is through additional uh, training, hands-on training that you can do, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But um, this is clearly a perceived gap in the industry. Second lesson learned, security is all about risk management. Now, traditionally, security has been uh, seen as a technology risk. But today, it's much, much broader than that. And we're really trying to tell uh, and explain to uh, boards and senior managers that it should be treated like a business risk and managed like any other business risk. It affects every part of the organization, supply chain, third parties, e-commerce, business operations, the plant facilities, particularly with uh, the, ex the increasing use of uh, IoT devices connected to the internet, communications, every employee has a computer. So it affects everyone in the organization and every part of the organization. And so a lot of the message that I talk about with uh, my clients is how can the senior management and boards really manage this as a business risk? There, are some, uh, there is some good guidance out there. The National Association of, of Corporate Directors has got some really good uh, guidance out there on how to, um, to manage uh, cybersecurity risk and what the board should be doing. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of directors don't know what questions to ask. And if they, even if they do know what questions to ask, they don't know how to evaluate the answers. So there's a, there's a, there's a big gap there, and, and uh, that's an area that I'm focused on personally. Um, just to give you an illustration, in the Equifax security data breach, the board of directors met 76 times related to the cybersecurity breach in 2017. That's a tremendous amount of time that the board was involved and engaged in, in, that, uh, in that breach. And since then, they've changed a lot of the protocols that uh, they have regarding communications around data breaches and the governance that they have over cybersecurity. So, uh, so there's a, there's a, it really needs to be managed like every other risk you manage in the organization. Um, the other thing we're see I'm seeing a lot of and I'm really excited about is increased focus on actually putting quantitative uh, metrics around cybersecurity risk and IT risk. Uh, there's organizations like the FAIR Institute that's starting to put um, uh, some, some dollar values. And, and I think that's really important as we communicate risk to the board and to the senior managers to be able to quantify things and be able to talk in business terms and talk it about it, it in financial terms. So I'm excited about the opportunities provided by uh, uh, methodolo methodologies like that. Um, also, on this point, we're also seeing that security, which has typically been part of the IT organization, is starting to uh, move outside of IT. At Equifax, the security function actually reported through legal. And we're seeing um, increasing, uh, increasingly that the senior security person, the, Ch the CISO, the senior information security officer, is often now reporting to C uh, the CEO directly as, as, as a peer to the CIO. Uh, over the last 20 years, there's been a significant increase or uh, investment in technology. 
Um, if you, it's hard to go to a security conference these days without seeing people talking about the impact of AI and machine learning and remote process automation and how that's going to help security and all these, as well as all the other traditional areas. Um, obviously, the cloud has had a big impact as well. The global security market is forecasted to grow by $300 billion um, by 2020, grow to $300 billion by 2024. So it's a huge market. But the big problem is vendor saturation. Um, you know, organiza organizations are bomba bombarded by just tons of technology uh, to protect their business. S studies show that companies on average have about 70 different te security technologies in place and operating in their environment. That's a huge amount of technology that you need to, as a security uh, leader, need to be able to manage and, and integrate, right? So that's, that's really difficult and really hard. Um, when, you, when you're looking to solve a security problem, you might be faced by as many as 1,500 vendors in that space and just determining which one is going to meet your requirements and how it's going to fit into your overall security architecture is a huge challenge. This, part of this is because there's been an explosive growth in venture capitalist in, in investment into the security space. It's seen as a, it's a, it's a very um, rich area for uh, investment. The, uh, in 2018, there were $5.3 billion in, uh, of venture capital funding went to security, which was up 20% from the previous year. So it's a difficult job for CISOs and CIOs to be able to determine what solutions they need to solve their cybersecurity problems. There's no shortage of technology, but the challenge is how do you, what we really lack, I think, is an is a integrated system of organizing around it. So people process and um, having the technology vendors work together. So it's a big challenge. Lesson number four, security is more than just uh, preventing prevention controls. It really is a framework or a, a system of applying a whole set of controls that work together. It should include preventative, detective, and responsive controls. Now, when I started my career, um, there was a, a leading security pr uh, standard called BS 1779. It was the early, uh, it was a British standard that, that had a, it talked about a framework for information security. That later became ISO 27, uh, 1770, 17799, and then ultimately ISO 27000, which is the current um, set of security uh, frameworks around, uh, published by the International Standards Organization. Also, we had uh, NIST in the 800 series that were um, published around that time, and, and they continue to have, have continued to evolve, uh, evolve. Today, most companies that I work with are either using ISO 27001 or the NIST critical security framework as their framework for, for managing security. And what these frameworks do is they really focus on um, having a good balance of preventative, detective, and responsive controls. So by preventative controls, we're talking about things like the physical locks, the authentication, the network segmentation, security awareness training, encryption, and secure um, configuration management, and patching. They are all preventative controls. They prevent things from happening. Then we have detective controls, which could be things like collection and analysis of event data, detection and logging, logging and monitoring, antivirus and malware detection, vulnerability scanning. And then we have responsive controls, which are things like your incident response process and your crisis management process. Now, a lot of the breaches that I have, I've studied have occurred because these, uh, this system of controls has broken down and um, there hasn't been enough focus on having that complete feedbacks, so there's been a lack of investment in detection or a lack of investment in response. So just think about the Equifax breach, right? It, the preventative control that failed was patching. The detective control that failed was actually um, an SSL uh, decryptors that were on the network that were supposed to detect suspicious activity. Those SSL uh, um, encrypt decryptors had not been updated with, the, with an up-to-date digital certificate for over 10 months prior to the breach. And so the detective control failed. And then there was the, and then the incident response um, process also had some challenges, as you probably recall. And I talk about it in my book. So, um, so there's an example. But it's really important that organizations uh, focus on the good balance between all three of those areas. I would say that today, uh, most managers do not understand cybersecurity in general. 
Um, and why is that? Well, I think uh, for a couple of things that are, a couple of trends, I think. One is we've seen a tremendous growth in uh, the connection of devices, right? So if you go back to, 2000, to the early 90s, the 1990s, there were about a million devices connected to the internet. Today, they estimate 42, million, 42 billion and growing. So that's, a, that's enough for like six per person. And just think about how many devices you have that are, pers that are connected to the internet. Your Google Assistants, your Amazons, your phones, your computers, your fridges, and we can go on. Um, the, other, the other thing is the growth in digitization of data. So everything today is being digitized, every business process, every, um, every piece of data. In 2006, it was estimated that we had 161 exabytes of digital data, and exabytes are um, a billion gigabytes. Today, so today, it's estimated we have 30,000. So just in about 10 years, we've gone from 161 exabytes to 30,000 exabytes of data. And then the other thing that's, that's, that's continued to change is really the attackers, the sophistication and capabilities of the attackers. So the tools that the attackers use today have become more and more sophisticated, yet the knowledge and expertise to execute many of those has, has decreased. So we have this sort of inverse relationship between the sophistication of attacks and the um, capabilities or the experience required and the expertise required to execute those. So, so that's all, that's sort of driven us to this point. But I think one of the challenges we have is in communicating with managers is the jargon we use. Uh, we're very, many of the people who have grown up in security have come, uh, have, taught, have been rooted in the, in the technology and we tend to talk very technically about the security topic. So we have to really start to communicate in terms that business leaders understand. We need to talk about risk and reward and, um, and so as opposed to bits and bytes. And I think frameworks like the NIST security framework, uh, which I'm a big fan on, um, helps us do that. Lesson number six, become certified. So there's lots of different security certifications out there. I talked about some of the challenges that uh, we have in the industry, or, or perceived challenges that people coming out of uh, formal education don't have enough hands-on experience. Well, one way to show that is to get certified. Um, there are some great entry-level certifications like the Security Plus uh, and the GX Security Essentials uh, certification. And then as you spend more time in your career, I would encourage you to, to also develop uh, and, and seek out uh, certifications, things like the CISSP from ISC Squared, the CISA from ISACA, um, maybe the uh, Computer Hacking or Forensics um, Investigator or the Ethical Hacking uh, certification. These are things that we look for when we're hiring people. All right, we've found the weak link. We've found the weak link, and it's us. Um, you know, what so we, I talked a little bit about the need for having these frameworks of controls, but the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges we have in security is not the, the, uh, the technology, it's the people, right? So where security often breaks down is because of the human error. It, we, we make mistakes, we forget, we're overworked, whatever the reason is. And our attackers can also utilize these basic human flaws. Think about ransomware, right? So ransomware... Is, is a big problem today and is growing. And it, this really came to the fore really in the last couple of years and we've seen this widespread growth of, of ransomware over the last couple of years. Um, 100, McAfee reported 118% ransomware attacks in the first quarter of this year alone. And what, what does ransomware do, does? It really uh, targets us as individuals. It's, it's trying to get us to click on that link in that email or to click on that website and launch a payload. Think about data breaches. You know, in the Equifax case, the, there was a breakdown in the controls because um, of the way that it was mainly a pro process issue because the information didn't get to the right people. But that was, you know, tied to, to um, humans that failed to do things in the organization. Uh, another one is application developers. If you're writing code, uh, Often the application developers fail to do the, take the necessary tests and checks uh, in the secure development process and therefore introduce vulnerabilities into the environment. 
Lesson number eight. Data breaches are, uh, we're gonna, uh, will continue. So our risk profile is constantly changing and uh, we need to continue to invest in, in um, and we're continuing to invest in, in significant digital transformation. So at the same time, our attackers are also getting more sophisticated. A recent study by Fortinet and Forbes uh, noted that 84% of security executives believe that the risk of cyber security attacks will increase, and a fifth of those believe that the capabilities are up, that the capabilities of the attackers are outpacing their capabilities to uh, defend themselves. Now, since I mentioned that, that we started tracking data breaches in 2005. Since that time, uh, there have been over 10,000 publicly disclosed data breaches, resulting in the disclosure of 11, over 11 billion accounts and records. And the data for this year is not helping, is not uh, looking any better, right? In the first six months of this year, uh, we have seen a 54% increase in data breaches over the previous year. So every, I, I would argue that every organization is a target, and you can see this, right? Um, Every, you just, your example this morning, right? It, how many, uh, every couple of days you will see a news article or you may be personally impacted by a data breach. So managing cybersecurity is hard, but, um, and these breaches are going to continue, continue. So that really reinforces my point before that we really need to make sure that if we, if we are breached, or as I say these days, when you are breached, that you have a good process in place to be able to admit it, uh, contain the damage, um, mitigate the impacts and respond uh, appropriately. Lesson number nine, build your network, the people one. All right, it's, in my experience, one of the most valuable assets I've had in my career has been my personal network. And I think it's really important as you uh, enter the workforce or as you, uh, uh, as you take a place in the cybersecurity industry, that you build a network. I would encourage you to participate in professional organizations, to attend conferences, uh, to meet people, to connect with them, to join them in, on LinkedIn, or connect with them on LinkedIn, uh, to follow people who are influencers in the, in the industry, and to find yourself a mentor. Uh, I've done all those things in my career, and it's helped me a lot. And so I, 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 as I've been out promoting my book, it's been great to see colleagues that I've had for many years reach out and ask for help to help me in uh, promoting my book and, to, and, and my business. So the, the network will pay forward, uh, and, you, and I would encourage you to pay forward for it as well as you, um, as you can. And then lesson number nine is never stop learning. The, the, the great thing about cybersecurity, it's a dynamic field. There's so much is going on, um, and I would encourage you to um, to learn, to continue learning, find an find a area where you have a passion for it and really um, develop a thirst for knowledge. You know, read books about cybersecurity. Listen to podcasts. Subscribe to, to cybersecurity feeds. Join groups. Network. Blog and write, write about it. Uh, research. And tinker and explore. Ethically, of course. Um, it, it really is an exciting field to be in, so I would encourage you to do that. So that, they are my 10 lessons that uh, I wanted to share with you. Um, I'll leave you here with my contact information. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or uh, other social media. Happy to, um, uh, and I would encourage you to read my book, obviously. Um, at this stage, I think, we've got, how are we doing? we've got time for a few questions, so any questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> um, yeah, so just briefly, um, so uh, I didn't spend a lot of time on it. So um, uh, to, tomorrow is, two years ago was when I was fired from Equifax for failing to forward an email. So um, the, the, uh, the, the, CEO, the CEO or the former CEO testified to Congress like two, week, two years ago this week um, that the cause of the breach was a human error and a technological error. 
the human error being the fail, failure to patch the patchy struts, and the technical error being the failure of a security scanner to um, detect the existence of an unpatched system. Um, and then he went on under further um, testimony to say that, that the reason why the person didn't patch it is because they didn't get the information because, you know, I, along with uh, uh, 260 or 360 other people that got the email, didn't forward it to people that could act on it, right? So, um, so that, was the, uh, that was what the company uh, testified to in, in, in front of Congress. Um, a, a, a subsequent investigations would show that, um, in fact, uh, as you said, the, the SSL decryptors on the, uh, were not updated with a digital, digital certificate for over 10 months. And because of that, the suspicious activity that was occurring was not detected. So um, it gets back to that you know, prevent and detect controls. If that detect control had been in place, if that digital certificate had been updated as it should have been, um, then we would have identified, you know, highly likely we would have identified the suspicious activity earlier and the impact would never have been as significant. Well, it would have if we'd, yeah, um, so um, there, were, there, was, there were other controls, DLP and things like that, but the problem is it, 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 we needed, you needed to see what the, I mean, this, this was a highly trafficked site, so it was a, um, there's tons of queries going in and out, I mean, it was used for disclosure, for people that were um, requesting, uh, uh, filing um, uh, requests to, um, you know, disputes regarding their credit report, right? And so I think it was like something like a million transactions a month. So it was a fairly highly trafficked site, right? A, mi a million sort of uh, registrations a month and probably a lot more around, probably more transactions than that. Um, but uh, so, so I think, you know, it, it got it lost a little bit in the noise. And then because we couldn't see the encrypted traffic, we couldn't see the payloads going backwards and forwards. I mean, as soon as we installed that digital certificate, within hours, we were able, we saw uh, these queries coming in that were returning 10 megabyte uh, uh, queries, right, and so uh, payloads, and so we immediately traced those and found that went back to a Chinese ISP, and then we started, you know, the the, the, the shut that down, and then the process of of trying to work out what was going on. So. Yes, I, I do think that, and, it, and, it, and the congressional reports came back um, at, and talked about that. Um, so, you know, the great thing about the Equifax breach is it's been a highly studied breach. So there's Equ uh, the House committee, how, two House committees investigated it, Senate, uh, Elizabeth Warren issued her own report, um, uh, the, the UK, the Canadian Privacy Commission, there's tons of uh, FAO, GAO, uh, GAO, FTC, there's been a lot of, a lot of reports on this. So... Um, so it's, it's very public, actually, what happened, which is not often the case with a data breach. So, um, uh, but they concluded, uh, you know, there was a bunch of conclusions they made, but um, in including, uh, uh, I think they labeled uh, my termination as a, as a public relations maneuver. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there were, it, it, they, I mean, a lot of it came back to um, just, you know, asset management, Controls went, uh, were not adequate, you know, patching controls were not adequate, the uh, communication process around patching, um, obviously the, the fact that the SSL certificates hadn't been, hadn't been updated. There were, at the time, there were 10,000 open uh, security vulnerabilities. Um, there was a lot, of, a lot of things, and then organizational and process issues as well. Well, there's, a, there's a, a bunch of things I think contribute to that. One is, I think, over the, over the last couple of decades, we've also seen increased uh, legislation by states on, um, uh, on data breach disclosures. 
so, um, and requirements to disclose those. So every state now, every, fifth, every one of the 50 states has a breach notification law in place today, which is what wasn't the case you know, 15 years ago. So one is you know, you, there's a requirement now to do more disclosure. Um, and then, of course, you've got GDPR and, and other uh, regulations if you're outside of the US. So that's one, one thing that's contributed to it. Um, you're correct in terms of the, 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 the trajectory on the, on the, amount, of, uh, on the uh, amount of data. But I would also note that at least 50% of the breaches actually occur in small companies. And um, one of the challenges that, that small companies have, small and medium-sized companies, is that they don't have the resources to be able to withstand uh, the reputational damage that occurs. And often, they will go out of business. Whereas the larger companies generally have the resources. I mean, Equifax has spent over $1.2 billion just on remediation, about, um, you know, and, and then another $700 million in, in fines and um, legal costs. So a company like that can, can, with, can withstand that. A small company cannot. And so, um, uh, so that, it, it does have a particular, um, there, you know, those small companies do really suffer. Yep. It's a, it's a great question. So the question was around, um, is it any particular industry or segment? No, it's everywhere, right? I mean, um, you've seen <laughs> universities, state government. I mean, here in Atlanta, the Atlanta, it was ransomware, but I mean, you know, we've got, um, we've got that being targeted. You've got medical, uh, healthcare is a big focus. Financial services has always been a target. But you're also seeing, um, you know, manufacturing environments. There was a manufacturing company in Europe that got closed down because of a, 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 an attack, right? So it, it's across the board. And, and, and one, you know, we've got three sort of groups out there that are perpetrating these attacks. We've got you know, just the criminals. They're looking for, for, to make uh, financial gain from, from the data they obtain. You've got sort of the hacktivist activist group that are just looking to cause damage or, or reputation, exp, you know, d damage and, and um, embarrassment. And then you've got nation states. And then that's the group that is uh, the hardest to defend from because they've got sort of, in many cases, um, you know, large resources that are working um, to, to try and find that one hole to be able to penetrate your system. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, bring your own devices. Um, I mean, there are, um, there are ways you can protect yourself against those. Um, I mean, every, every uh, new technology that comes along changes the risk profile and changes the attack surface, right? So whether it be BYODs, whether it be connecting your SCADA systems to the network, uh, you know, um, it, the, the, the attack surface is constantly changing. So I, don't, um, I think there are, and, and in many cases, there are technologies to be able to help you manage that. So um, I don't think necessarily it's, it's uh, it, you can protect yourself from it. I don't, you know, some companies just decide not to allow BOIDs, just not to deal with that. Um, but uh, but I do, there are technologies out there that can, you can use to help protect you, and uh, it's a risk decision that you have to sort of work through. The, the, the network these days is, uh, is very expensive. The nodes that, you can, that uh, your, people, your employees and contractors and third parties connect to, it's, it's, it's hard to manage and define. Have one more question? <laughs> oh, you're going to get a book and you're going to get a book because you answer the questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So, I mean, I think, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of debate, you know, that sort of zero trust model, right? And so you sort of look at, um, the, you really have to t protect the endpoint because the network really these days is in many ways is open, I think, is what you're getting at, right? So, um, you know, I think, I think that's hard to do. It's hard to do in reality because you've got a lot of legacy it's, it's easier to do in the new environments, right? If you're running everything in the cloud or you're running everything you know, using mo modern technology. But the reality is most large companies today have legacy. And that was one of the issues we had at Equifax. You know, we, had, we were running that system that got breached was on a Sun, uh, a Sun Solaris um, so, uh, box. And so, you know, the, so some of the challenges, you, some of these security technologies don't work well with those legacy te technologies. So... But the technical debt that companies have and being able to retire that is a, is a big risk that, um, you know, we talk, that I uh, talk a lot about with, uh, with companies. I think that's, that's it. Well, I appreciate the time, um, and uh, hopefully there's something valuable there for you. And thanks. Enjoy the day.